Hello, everybody. So today we're going to continue with our part two of the urinary system. Okay, we left off with how urine is, form, is uh, formed in the human body through the kidneys. Okay, so let's take a look at the properties uh, or the composition of urine. Okay, so the term urinalysis refers to the examination of physical and chemical properties of urine. So when a doctor, you know, asks you to, <clears throat> asks you to, you know, pee in a cup, uh, they're going to do urinalysis tests, which are going to examine the properties of your urine physically and chemically. Okay, the appearance of your urine is going to vary from very clear to a deep amber or yellowish color or goldish color, depending on your state of hydration. Uh, the yellow color is due to urochrome pigments from the breakdown of hemoglobin in red blood cells. Okay, so you shouldn't have whole hemoglobin in your urine. You should have broken down hemoglobin. Uh, which has been filtered out um, by the nephron. Okay, cloudiness or blood in your urine could suggest some type of uh, urinary tract infection or UTI, as it's called. Okay, could in, uh, indicate that you've been through a trauma. Maybe you got um, physically injured and your kidney has been damaged slightly. Or cloudiness could um, be an indication of kidney stones. Uh, pyuria is pus in the urine. Okay, so maybe there's an infection festering in your kidney and uh, pus is getting into your urine which could cause it to be cloudy uh, hematoria which we spoke about uh, previously is blood in the urine and that could be due to again urinary tract infections some type of trauma or kidney stones okay uh, and then the odor of your urine okay everyone's uh, urine has some slight uh, odor some people maybe have more odor okay and that's all going to depend on the, uh, it's going to depend a lot on your diet, okay, but um, bacteria are in your urine that degrade uh, urea into ammonia, okay, and that ammonia smell is going to be very prevalent in, in urine, uh, really no matter what, but some foods and some diseases, okay, like UTIs, okay, can impart some particular aromas, okay, um, UTIs uh, are, are basically due to yeast that are growing uh, a little bit uh, out of out of whack that could cause uh, yeast infections. Okay, UTIs can be bacterial. Okay, and they can impart some type of odor sometimes. The chemical composition of your urine is about ninety five percent water and five percent solutes. Okay, uh, normally in your urine you'll have urea. We spoke about that. You'll have sodium chloride. You'll have calcium, uh, potassium chloride. You'll have creatine, uric acid, phosphates, sulfates. Traces of calcium, magnesium, bicarbonate, urochrome, which is that he broken down hemoglobin, and traces of bilirubin that came from your liver. Okay, these are all normal things that are in the filtrate uh, that we spoke about in the previous lecture. What you don't want to see in your urine, okay, you do not want to see glucose in your urine. We need that glucose uh, for ATP production. We need that glucose for energy production in, in the body. So that glucose should be reabsorbed, okay, in the renal tubules. You don't want to see free hemoglobin. Like I said before, you want to see broken down hemoglobin, uh, but you don't want to see free hemoglobin, okay? That could mean that blood is getting into your urine. You don't want to see proteins, okay? Remember, albumin is the, the highest um, protein we have in our bloodstream. We do not want to see proteins in our, in our urine. We want to see it in our blood. This should not even pass the barrier uh, of the glomerulus that should stay in the bloodstream. Okay, ketones. Ketones are a compound that we use or that we make from fats when we are low on glucose in our in our bloodstream. Um, most of the time, uh, like when you're sleeping, you'll make ketones because you don't have food in your system because you, you're obviously you're sleeping. Um, and we don't want to see these ketones in our urine. We want to see them in our bloodstream and the bile pigments. Okay. Bile pigments is what makes our, you know, makes our feces the color that they are. Okay. We don't want to see bile pigments in our urine. We want to have that more in our digestive system and in our bloodstream floating around. Okay. Uh, the pH range, normal pH range, uh, is around four and a half to 8.2. Okay. It's normally around six. So it's mildly acidic, okay? So this is the, the range of humans, but 
the average human has around six pH of their urine, which is, like I said, very mildly acidic. Uh, urine volumes, okay, so how much urine you have, okay, a normal adult should urinate around one to two liters a day, okay, you might not think that you urinate that much, but you you could fill up a, a, a two liter bottle of soda uh, if you have a normal um, urine volume, okay, polyuria, okay, that's when you have less or um, an excess of two liters a day, okay, and there are going to be reasons for that, and we'll, we'll take a look at that shortly, oligoria, that's when you have an output of less than 500 milliliters a day. 500 milliliters is very little, okay? Not a lot at all, okay? Um, kind of like a, a small cup of coffee, to be honest with you, okay? Uh, anuria is 0 to 100 milliliters a day. That's really, really low, and that's that's definitely not good, okay? What can that cause? Low output from kidney disease. Um, so these low outputs can be caused by some type of kidney disease, most likely they're due to dehydration, okay, a circulatory shock, okay, so if you kind of have like a heart attack or something like that, you can have a low output of, of urine. Uh, if you have prostate enlargement, okay, that's for the fellas, okay, uh, males have prostates uh, that could uh, impede on their uh, urine volume uh, or actually the release of urine, not necessarily the production of urine, but the release of urine could be affected um, by prostate enlargement. Uh, low urine output of less than 400 milli milliliters a day. Uh, what happens there is the body cannot maintain a, a safe, uh, low concentration of waste, which could lead to azotemia, which again is the increase in nitrogen wastes in the bloodstream. Okay, and we don't want that. So if you have low urine output, that probably means that you're not getting rid of waste products, which means that those waste products are staying in your blood, which can lead to azotemia. Okay. okay, diabetes. Okay, we've all heard of the term diabetes. Uh, there are a couple of different types of diabetes. The term diabetes, the definition of it is any metabolic disorder that results in chronic polyuria, okay, which means that you are urinating a lot, right? Um, at least four uh, forms of diabetes exist. We have diabetes mellitus 1 and 2. So you have type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. That's diabetes mellitus. Okay. Then you have gestational diabetes. So that's 1, 2, and this is the third type. Okay. Um, you have high concentrations of glucose in the renal tubule in these types of diabetes. Okay. Glucose is going to kind of stop the reabsorption of water if it's in the renal tubule. And if you don't reabsorb water, that means it's going to go into your bladder, All right? So if you have high um, glucose content, okay, because, and why would you have high, let's think about what happens, right? You, you, you have high glucose, high G, your body makes insulin to reduce the glucose. And then that glucose is used for ATP. Okay, but let's say that doesn't happen. That's the normal thing. Let's say that doesn't happen. You have high glucose. You don't make insulin, which means you're going to continue to have high glucose, which stops reabsorption of water, okay, which means that water is going to have to go to your bladder, and you're going to urinate a lot, okay? That's the, that's the process there, okay? Uh, more water passes into your urine. Okay, and then eventually you could get glucosuria, which means you can have glucose in your urine. If there's if there's way too much glucose in your bloodstream, okay, glucose isn't going to be reabsorbed either. Okay, and you're going to have glucose in your urine. Okay, in all three of those types of diabetes. Okay, diabetes insipidus. Okay, this is this is not the same kind of diabetes as diabetes one and two. It really has nothing to do with your pancreas and insulin production. These these three deal with pan uh, insulin production due to your pancreas. Either your pancreas is making too much, your, uh, is not making enough uh, insulin, or your body's not um, reacting to the insulin that's being made by the pancreas. Diabetes insipidus is not really like that. It's more of a disorder that just causes lots of water uh, to go and pass into your urine. Okay. Uh, diuretics, 
Okay, the term diuretics, you might have heard this term before. Um, diuretics are any chemical that increase your urine volume. So there are lots of things that are diuretics. Water is a diuretic. Um, diet sodas. Oops. Diet sodas are diuretics. Things with caffeine, coffee, tea, those things are diuretics. Okay, alcohol. That's a diuretic. These, these things increase urine volume. Okay, uh, some of them work differently than others. Okay, some increase your filtration rate in the glomerulus. That's what GFR stands for, glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so some are going to increase the filtration rate like caffeine. Caffeine is going to increase the filtration rate. And we, we spoke about this in the last uh, lecture. If you increase this filtration rate, you decrease reabsorption, right? If, if things are flowing too fast, then things cannot be reabsorbed. Right? If things are going too, too fast, you can't reabsorb them. Therefore, those things are going to go to the bladder. And in this case, it's going to be water. Right, So if, if the filtration rate's too quick, you can't reabsorb H2O. That H2O is going to end up in your bladder, and you're going to end up urinating a lot more. Right, If you drink a lot of coffee during the day, you will probably go to the bathroom a lot more. And you'll, you'll notice, if you do drink a lot of coffee, when you do go to the bathroom during the day as you're drinking that coffee, your urine is very um, diluted. You have very uh, clear, um, clear urine. And that's because all the water that's in your body is not being reabsorbed back into your body. It's going right to your bladder. So it's not that you're very hydrated. You're not. Okay, You're actually dehydrating yourself. Okay, the, That water that's in your urine should actually be in the body being used for other things. But because you're drinking caffeine, you're blocking that reabsorption and that... Um, is getting released from the body. Okay, that is something that I have to deal with because I drink way too much coffee on a daily basis. Okay, uh, some other diuretics will inhibit or reduce tubular reabsorption of water um, because they inhibit this hormone, ADH. Okay, ADH stands for anti-diuretic hormone. Anti-diuretic hormone is going to allow for reabsorption. Okay, um, we want antidiuretic hormone uh, in order to reabsorb water. Alcohol will block this hormone. Okay, so if you take the hormone away, you don't get reabsorption. And just go to go back up there, you don't get reabsorption, and that water goes to your bladder. Okay, and you have to urinate more. So when you drink alcohol, you feel the need to urinate more when you're drinking alcohol, um, not because it's increasing the flow rate, but it's but because it's blocking hormones, okay? Alcohol will block this hormone, which will make you go to the bathroom more. It's the same, it's the same outcome, right? The outcome is that reabsorption of water is stopped. No matter if this diuretic is increasing the flow or if this diuretic is blocking a hormone, the, the result is that water cannot be reabsorbed and therefore goes to your bladder and then you have to urinate, okay? So the outcome is the same, but the the process is different, right? Okay, diuretics are commonly used to treat hypertension and congestive heart failure. So sometimes you want to use diuretics in order to help people. Okay, so if people have heart issues, okay, uh, you want to redirect uh, or reduce the body's fluid volume and you want to reduce blood pressure. Okay, and, and you reduce blood pressure by taking away volume. Okay, and you can do that with diuretics. Okay, if you give a, an individual diuretics, it will reduce their, their water volume in their body which should reduce their blood pressure. Okay, okay uh, urine storage and elimination. So urine is produced continuously all day. It's not just produced when you have to go to the bathroom, it's produced all the time. Um, it does not drain continually from the body, however, right? You, it drains and collects into your, into your bladder and when you have to release it or when you feel the need to release it, you release it. Okay, urination is episodic, which means you have episodes of where you go to the bathroom, okay, occurring when we allow it to occur. Okay, it's made possible by storage apparatus and neural controls of timely release, which we're going to talk about now. Okay, uh, the ureters. The ureters are those tubes that lead from the kidney to the bladder, right? So if we have, okay, we have our kidneys here, we have our bladder down here, okay? The liquid that is made or the urine that is made by the kidneys 
has to get down to the bladder. And these tubes that go down to the bladder are called the ureters. Okay, they are retroperitoneal, which means they sit behind your intestines and your digestive tract. Uh, they are muscular tubes that extend from each kidney to the urinary bladder. They're about 25 centimeters long. That's roughly uh, that's roughly a, a, a one foot ruler. A one foot ruler is about 30 centimeters. Okay, so it's a little bit under uh, a foot. Uh, they pass posterior to the bladder. Okay, so they go behind the bladder and they actually enter the bladder. If I was to draw this correctly, they enter bl the bladder from underneath. Okay, they enter the bladder from underneath. Okay, I should have drawn that a little better the first time. Okay, there's a flap of mucosa at the entrance of each ureter, and that acts as a, as like a one-way valve so that urine doesn't back up into the kidney, right? So when urine actually goes into the bladder, it cannot leave the bladder through the same way it entered, very much like the valves of your heart, right? Uh, you, when you have blood going through your tricuspid valve, you don't want it to backflow up into your right atria because it's a one-way valve. It stops the flow from going backwards. Same thing here. Okay, when, when urine flows into the bladder, it cannot flow out of the bladder because this valve has closed. Okay, we don't want urine to back up into the kidney. That would be a bad thing. Okay, the urinary bladder itself. Okay, so those ureters lead to the bladder which is a muscular sac located at the floor of the pelvic cavity, okay? Your, your bladder sits at the base of your pelvis, okay? It's inferior or below the peritoneum, so it's below your, your intestines, and posterior to your pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis is, are those two bones at the very front of your pelvis, okay? And your bladder sits behind those bones. There's a detrusor muscle uh, that is, um, that, that, is like the lining of the wall of the bladder, and that muscle is going to be able to contract to expel urine. Okay, your bladder is made of transitional epithelium. Uh, if you th remember back to like you know one of the first couple of lectures in uh, the first semester, the fall semester, uh, transitional epithelium has the ability to stretch. Okay, uh, which is really really helpful when when um, talking about the urinary bladder because the bladder has to be able to enlarge as urine fills the bladder. Okay, if, if, you're, if your bladder didn't enlarge, you would be going to the bathroom a lot more often, right? It would fill up a lot quicker and then you would have you would feel the need to go to the bathroom a lot, a lot more uh, if it didn't uh, stretch and allow for more volume uh, when you needed it. Okay, there are cells on the surface of your transitional epithelium that protect it from the acidic nature of the of the urine, and those cells are called umbrella cells. Okay, so those are going to be a protective layer because your your urine is slightly acidic and could be more acidic depending on your diet and your level of hydration, and you don't want to destroy your transitional tissues um, if uh, your urine was too acidic. So these umbrella cells are going to help protect those. And just like your stomach, there are wrinkles in your bladder when your bladder is empty and it and it shrinks. Um, it kind of has these wrinkles inside, and those wrinkles are the same name as the wrinkles inside of your stomach, and those are called rugae. Okay, the, what rugae are, these little wrinkles, is they're going to be able to increase surface area. In your stomach, that surface area is really important for uh, digestion and absorption, right? You want, you want as much surface area to absorb nutrients as you possibly can. In the bladder, you want surface area so that you can expand that, that, uh, the walls of the bladder to accommodate more volume of, of urine. The urine can hold, okay, moderate fullness is about 500 milliliters. Okay, that's maximum fullness is, is around 700 to 800 milliliters. Okay, so when, when you feel like you have to use the, the restroom, okay, you're, you're probably around this 500 mil number, okay. Uh, if you feel that it's like an emergency and you can't hold it anymore, you're more likely around this number. Okay, and you can have less. You know, obviously, you, you can have up to these numbers, right? Um, the urinary bladder can stretch. Okay, that's what distensible means. Okay, it can stretch and, and become larger because of its uh, transitional epithelial nature. Okay, as it as it fills, it expands upwards. Okay, it doesn't expand downwards towards your pelvic floor. It it expands superiorly, so it expands upward. Okay. As it expands, these rugae, those wrinkles, they flatten out, okay, because as they 
it's like a think of like a deflated balloon. A deflated balloon is all wrinkly and, and folded. But when you inflate a balloon, all those wrinkles and folds go away. And then the, the walls of the balloon are smooth. Right. It's the same thing with your bladder. Right. Your bladder, when it's when it's empty, has all these little folds and creases and wrinkles. And then when it's full of urine, it, it expands and all those wrinkles stretch and those wrinkles go away. Okay, so here is a picture of the urinary bladder. This is actually a female urinary bladder, and we'll tell why in a moment. We'll, we'll show pictures of each one. But we can see the, the ureter here from the right kidney. We can see the left ureter here. Here's our urinary bladder. Okay, this is that detrusor muscle that lines this, this big, thick muscle that goes along the middle of the bladder itself. Okay. Here we have the urethra, okay, which is where urine will exit the bladder, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, but we have the bladder here, and we have our ureters there. We have our detrusor muscle here. Okay. We'll come back to this in a moment. Okay, um, kidney stones. Okay, just before we get to the to the urethra and everything else, kidney stones. Um, the technical name is a renal calculus. Okay, which is a hard granule of calcium phosphate, calcium oxalate, uric acid, or magnesium salts. Um, and they form in the renal pelvis. Okay, so we looked at that, though. That's basically where the, the major uh, calyces are going to uh, all meet up. And that's where um, the renal pelvis ends up becoming the ureter. Okay, so right before the ureter is where these kidney stones form. Okay, a lot of times they're small enough and pass unnoticed. Okay, you might even have had kidney stones that have passed through you that you don't even know about because they, they can be that small. Okay, uh, you only really notice them when they get to a certain size. Okay, large stones can block the renal pelvis. Uh, they can get stuck in the ureter. They can block the ureter. Um, they can cause pressure buildup when they do that because then urine can't get out, right? And if it's like, it's like blocking a pipe, right? If you block a pipe, then pressure builds up behind that that blockage. Um, if you do build up pressure behind the blockage and into the and into the kidney, okay, you can destroy the nephrons of the cell. It's like you can break the pipes in your plumbing, right? So to speak. No, no, no pun intended. That's it's actual what's going on. Okay, uh, the passage of large jagged stones is very excruciatingly painful. I have a friend's dad who, who deals with kidney stones all the time. Okay, and it can damage the ureters if they're sharp enough, and that could cause bleeding and hematuria, which is blood in the urine, okay? Uh, a lot of times doctors will try to break kidney stones up with sonograms, the same like uh, same technology that you use to to look at, uh, you know, children in the womb, babies in the womb. Okay, what could cause kidney stones? Okay, hypercalcemia, which means, you know, too much calcium uh, in the diet. Okay, dehydration, that's a big one. Okay, when you're dehydrated, these calcium deposits form because they're they're not diluted, right? If you've ever had like, if you ever made like iced tea from mix, if you ever put like a scoop of iced tea mix into a bottom of a, of a, you know, a container and then you add water and you mix it up, sometimes there's, there's a undissolved mix at the bottom. Okay. And that's because you put too much mix in. It's super saturated. Um, same kind of thing happens here. If you dehydrate yourself, what you're left with is calcium. Okay. And that calcium can combine and form crystals and, and form these stones. Okay, pH imbalances uh, could form kidney stones. Uh, frequent urinary tract infections. Okay, if you get UTIs a lot, that could lead to kidney stones. Okay, and large prostate can lead to kidney stones. Um, and the reason for that is because it's retaining uh, urine. Okay, so if you hold urine back, um, that could cause kidney stones because you're keeping the wastes in you longer, which could then lead to kidney stones. Okay, treatments can include stone dissolving drugs, which help to, to, to dissolve the stones. A lot of times surgery is needed, okay, if the stones are too big and they can't, uh, they can't pass, okay. And then lithotripsy, okay, which is a non-surgical technique that pulverizes stone with ultrasounds, like I said before, okay. That is a kidney stone. These are two kidney stones. You can just imagine how sharp and jagged these edges are. Okay, and how large they are. Okay, your ureters are not that that big. They don't have a they don't have a ruler here to show you how big these stones are. Okay, but 
trust me, they are big enough to cause significant discomfort. Okay, so from the bladder, okay, uh, your urethra is the last um, part of your urinary tract, okay, and that is the tube that conveys urine out of the body, okay? So when your bladder is full and you want to release that urine, that urine has to exit through the urethra. Okay, the female and male urethra are slightly different. The function is exactly, is exactly the same. Really, the only difference is going to be the, the length of the urethra because of the external genitalia of, uh, of the male penis. Um, but the female urethra is about three to four centimeters long, and it's bound to the anterior wall of the vagina. Okay, the vagina and the urethra are definitely not the same thing, so please don't get that confused. The external urethral orifice is between the vagina and the clitoris, okay? There is something that we call the external urethral sphincter, and that's a muscle that's going to surround the urethra externally on a female, okay? There's going to be an external and an internal in a male, okay? Uh, there's only an external urethral sphincter in a female, and this is where the urethra passes through the pelvic floor, and it's, it's part of your skeletal muscle system, and it is voluntary. Okay, you can, females can control their external urethral sphincter for when they want to use the bathroom. Okay, so here is the bladder. Here is the urethra. Okay, whoops, let me go back. Okay, here is the urethra. That's opening here, and that's where urine can pass through the urethra out of the body. And here is that external urethral sphincter. And that is a circular muscle that can tighten and close off the passage of urine out of the urethra. Okay. It basically just squeezes. It's like if you squeezed a straw, right? Make believe this is a straw that lets urine out of the bladder. And if you, you know, used your fingers and squeezed the tip of the straw, the liquid would not be able to pass through the straw. That's what your urethral, uh, external urethral sphincter does. Okay. The male urethra is 18 centimeters long. Okay, it's about it's more than four times as long as the female urethra. There are three regions. There's the part that uh, goes through the prostate, okay, the prostatic urethra. There's a part that is going to pass through the, the base of the pelvic cavity which is called the membranous urethra. And then you have the spongy urethra, which is going to go through the penis itself. Okay. There's an internal urethral sphincter in a male, and there's an external urethral sphincter in a male. Okay. And we'll see that right now. Okay. So here's the male reproductive system and, and your genital system. So here's our bladder. Here's our urethra. Same thing. But this is where the urethra ends on a female, right? With a male, that urethra has to, ex has to extend through the penis and out, okay? So the female would have ended here, but the males end at the end of the penis, okay? Here is the internal urethral sphincter, the same position as the female, but here, I'm sorry, that's the internal um, urethral sphincter at the base of the bladder. Females do not have that. I apologize for that. Okay. Here is the prostate, uh, the prostate gland that males have that surrounds part of their urethra. So that is the prostate or prosthetic urethra right there. Okay. If I change colors. Okay. Here is the external urethral sphincter, that's in the same exact spot that females have it. Okay, females do not have this internal one, but they do have this external urethral sphincter. So males can kind of control their urine a little bit better because they have two sphincters that are controlling the flow, right? Because uh, like if you have two fingers on that straw, okay, you have more control, right? You can squeeze your fingers up top and then you can squeeze your fingers here, okay, to control the flow of uh, urine. Males with enlarged prostates, okay, this is the prostate again. If you enlarge this prostate, you're going to squeeze the urethra and make the urethra smaller, which makes it harder to urinate if you have a enlarged uh, prostate, okay, uh, which can be a, a, a very 
big struggle for older gentlemen because older gentlemen prostates tend to tend to swell up um, and that causes a lot of discomfort in trying to urinate because they can't get the urine past the urethra in the in the prostate because it's enlarged okay. UTIs okay uh, cystitis is the infection of the urinary bladder it's especially common in females because of how, of how short the urethra is uh, it can be triggered in females by sexual intercourse, okay, and it can spread up into the ureter, causing pyelitis, okay, which is an infection of the renal pelvis. Okay, so you want to be very careful, okay. You don't want to get uh, kidney infections. Okay? You don't want UTIs to spread into the kidneys. You want them to stay local in the in the in the bladder if possible or the ureter if possible. Pyelonephritis. Okay, this is an infection that reaches the cortex and the nephrons, okay, so that it's not just in the renal pelvis, it actually got into the cortex, which is the outermost part of the kidney, right? If we, if we remember, you know, last lecture, you know, the cortex is this outer rim, okay, the renal pelvis is over here, and then your ureter is here, right? If that infection gets here, it's called pyelitis. If that infection spreads into the actual kidney, into the cortex, okay, that's pyelonephritis, okay, and that's that's a much deeper infection, okay, and that can re that can be a result of some type of bloodborne bacteria. That's typically not going to be due to uh, an out of control UTI. Okay, out of control UTI is typically gonna gonna stop at the renal uh, pelvis right there. Okay. Okay, voiding urine, getting urine out of your body. Okay, between acts of urination, the bladder will fill up. These detrusor muscles will relax, okay, and the urethral sphincters are going to tightly close. So that that's what um, that's in between urinations, okay. When your detrusor muscle relaxes, um, it's it's ready to get filled up again, okay. The urethral sphincters are, are nicely tightly closed, and you don't have to urinate, okay. Uh, micturition is the act of urinating, okay, and the the reflex, the micturition reflex is uh, involuntary. Uh, it's an involuntary spinal reflex that partly controls urination. So here are the first four steps. And, you know, depending on um, your maturity and development, these four steps might be different and you'll see why in a sec. Okay, so if step number one is stretch receptors detect filling of the bladder. So the bladder fills up with liquid uh, urine and there are the stretch receptors that detect that this is happening and it tells your spinal cord. Okay, there are you know, nervous signals that transmit this to your spinal cord. Those signals return to the bladder from the spinal cord at uh, sacral vertebrae two and three. Okay, and then there are signals that excite that detrusor muscle. And those signals are then going to relax the sphincter, right? So the bladder fills, okay, your body knows the bladder is filling. It tells the spinal cord, your body then reacts to that input, right? And that reaction is to excite the muscle of the bladder, which is going to squeeze the bladder, right? If when you, when you excite this detrusor muscle, you're, you're contracting it. So it's like squeezing a balloon, right? If you, if you squeeze a water balloon, what's going to, and you have a hole in the balloon, what's going to happen? Water's going to come out of the balloon, right? Same thing here. So your bladder is, is you know, filling. This detrusor muscle is is excited. The urethral sphincter is relaxing. Okay, and if this is not voluntary, okay, if if this is something that you know you don't necessarily want to happen, but it's happening anyway, okay, then uh, then you will urinate. You will void, and that voiding will be involuntary. So this is like this could what happen to to kids when they wet the bed, right, or when someone gets really really scared. Um, this could happen to them. This is not going to be a normal, everyday um, act of urinating. Okay, this is more uh, the voluntary control is going to be more of what you you experience on a daily basis. Okay, so after steps one, two, three. Okay, after the the stretch receptors, the signals go to the spinal cord. Okay, what's going to happen is the pons, your brain, is going to receive signals from those stretch receptors. Okay, instead of your spinal cord, it's going to actually go to your brain. Okay, your brain then figures out, is this a timely time to go to the bathroom or is this an untimely time to go to the bathroom? 
right? Is this, do I have time to get to a toilet and use the bathroom? Or am I, you know, in the middle of something and I can't go right now, right? Am I in the car? Am I, you know, doing something where I can't get to the bathroom? So is it timely or untimely? That's what your brain figures out. If you're, if it is timely, then what happens is that you go to the bathroom and your brain excites that muscle and relaxes your urethra and you go to the bathroom. If it's untimely, if it's not a good time to go to the bathroom, then you're not going to do that. Okay. You're going to keep the sphincter muscles contracted and urine is retained. All right. So if it's timely, your body causes that muscle of the bladder to squeeze. It releases that urethral sphincter and you can get rid of the urine. If it's not timely, your body makes sure that that urethra is nice, tightly shut so that you don't urinate on yourself. Okay. Uh, if it is timely to urinate, signals from the pond cease in the external urethra and its sphincter relaxes and urine is voided. Okay. That's if it was a female because this, in a male, the internal sphincter, uh, the internal sphincter is going to relax and then the external sphincter will relax. In a female, it's just the external. Okay. So if it's timely, the brain knows it and allows you to go. If it's not timely, the brain knows that and allows you not to go. Okay. That's the voluntary control. Okay, this is exactly what we just said. Here's the involuntary reflex. Okay, this will happen okay, if you're scared or nervous or other times. Okay, and here's your voluntary. That's that's the majority of, of your experience is going to the bathroom. Okay, and it all depends on where it goes. Remember, the involuntary, the, the main thing here, the involuntary doesn't go to the brain. Okay, the involuntary goes to the sacrum. Okay, the nerves at the sacrum. Okay, where the voluntary goes all the way up to the brain and the brain's like, we can go green light or we can not go red light. Okay. And we, we had spoken about this very early on. We had spoken about hemodialysis and that's uh, that's due to this is a procedure that is done um, when your kidneys are going into failure or they're not working sufficiently. Um, basically, what happens when your kidneys aren't working, you still have to have the the function of those kidneys in order to live. You can't live without kidneys. So kidneys filter your blood. And once your kidneys stop working so good when you get older sometimes, you still need your blood cleaned um, regardless of, of if your kidneys are working on it. Now, before modern medicine, you know, kidney failure meant, you know, you, you were going to die because you can't live without your kidneys working. Okay, but now that we have um, modern medicine and, and technology, we can do something called hemodialysis which is where, you know, if you take a person whose kidneys are not functioning properly or not, uh, you know, filtering blood very good, going into renal failure, and you basically hook them up to a machine which acts as a fake kidney, okay? So this uh, machine here, this hemodialysis machine is going to be hooked up to the patient in two ways, okay? We wanna take blood from an artery and when that blood is gonna flow out of the person into the machine, which filters the blood, just like the kidney would filter the blood, okay? And then it's going to give that blood back to the individual. So the blood comes out of you into the machine, gets filtered, and then gets put back into you, just like the glomerulus, right? Our blood went into the glomerulus, got filtered, and then came out of the glomerulus and went back into you, right? So the blood went in, to the glomerulus, got filtered and went out. And then, you know, the renal tube and the loop of Henle and all that other stuff took care of all the stuff that was filtered out and put it into your urine. Okay, here, this machine is acting as the glomerulus. Okay, this machine is just acting as that glomerulus and it's getting rid of the waste, just like your bladder and urinary system would get rid of the waste. Okay, this, this is not a very fun thing to have to do, right? And if you are kidney failure, you might, and the, the, the worse your kidneys are, the more this has to be done, right? So if, if you have slight kidney failure, you might have to do this maybe once or twice a month. If you have, and the more that kidney failure increases, it might be once a week. It might be twice a week. It might be three times a week. It might be every day, okay? And you'd have to go to a special, uh, you know, place that does dialysis. You have to sit there for hours because it takes hours for your all of your blood to be drained from you, put into a machine, and then put back into you. Right. And, and not all your blood is taken out at once. Obviously, it's, it's a it's a flow. Right. So as blood is coming out, 
you know, blood is going back in. So you constantly have, you know, the, the, the correct amount of blood. So you're not going to die from anything like that, but it, it's not a, it's not a pleasant uh, thing to go through. Okay. So renal insufficiency is a state which the kidneys cannot maintain homeostasis due to, to, due to extensive destruction of the nephrons. What could cause nephron destruction? Okay. Hypertension can do that. Chronic kidney infections, traumas. Okay. If you get hit in the kidneys, if you've been tackled or punched, okay, if you're a boxer or a, a football player or something like that, prolonged ischemia and hypoxia, uh, poisoning by heavy metals or solvents, blockage of the renal tubes, um, Arteriosclerosis, which is, uh, you know, the, the hardening and you know, of uh, blood vessels. Okay. Glomerulonephritis, which is the uh, inflammation of the glomerulus. Okay. All these things could cause nephron destruction. Uh, nephrons can regenerate, which is a good thing. And kidney function can be restored if you have short-term injuries. So if you are a boxer or something like that, and you have um, blood in your urine the next day after a fight, Okay, your kidney can regenerate and restore, but if this happens over you know, many, many periods of time, okay, that could lead to nephron destruction. Okay, other nephrons will compensate for the loss of kidney function, but once you get down to a certain amount of, of nephrons lost, um, you know, there's not there's just not going to be enough compensation to occur. Okay, you can survive with one third of one kidney. Okay, so there, you you can. You can get kidneys removed. You can have portions of kidneys removed, and you can still uh, function fairly well. But um, life's going to change for you. Okay, when seventy-five percent of the nephrons are lost, your urine output is very, very low, and it's insufficient to maintain homeostasis. Right. So if you have only one third of one kidney, okay, your remember we were supposed to we're supposed to release you know almost two liters a day of urine. If your urine output is thirty milliliters an hour. Um, that's not near a liter of urine, uh, that's going to be insufficient to maintain homeostasis. And that's going to cause, you know, the waste to stay in your bloodstream, which is going to lead to azotemia. It could lead to acidosis, meaning your urine could become very acidic. Your blood could become very acidic. Okay. Uh, so this hemodialysis procedure is going to be done. Okay. It's an artificial way of clearing the wastes from your bloodstream. Okay, waste to leave the blood, enter the, the dialysis fluid as the blood flows through dialysis tubing, which is, and what, what all this means, dialysis fluid and this cellophane tubing, these are all just things to, to replicate the glomerulus uh, filtration in the body. Okay. And that's going to do it. So if you have any questions, make sure you leave them in the comments or you can email me. And I will see you for the next chapter.